Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. May our Lord Jesus' peace and grace be with all of us. Welcome to our Sunday service this morning. Before we start our service, may I ask everyone, you know, to turn around and share our Lord Jesus' love with your neighbors. You know, just say to the person sitting in front of you, on your left and right and at the back of you, just say from the bottom of your heart, just say, Jesus love you and I love you too. Let's do that in 30 seconds, okay? Grab the opportunity. <laughs> Let's do some exercise. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's start our Sunday service with The Collect. Today's call to worship is taken from Psalm chapter 136, verse 1 to 3. Psalm 136, verse 1 to 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us with a new day. May our Lord Jesus' presence and Holy Spirit fill our hearts. Lord Jesus, we want to ask for your forgiveness and repentance of our sins. Please continue to protect and provide us for the coming week. Please make your presence known and may each one of us experience you in our daily lives. Please open our hearts, ears and minds so that we can focus on you and hear your voice only. Please bless our guest speaker, Brother Jeffrey, as he shares your words with us this morning. May our Lord Jesus' love continue to grow in each of our hearts and let us learn how to love our neighbors as ourselves. All glories belong to our Lord Jesus alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us all rise and please join our praise team in praising and worshiping our God, for our God is good and His love endures forever. Amen. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, man on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty, for the living well, only you can satisfy. Sweetness at the mercy seat, now I've tasted, it's not hard to see. Only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock There's honey in the rock Freedom where the spirit is Bounty in the wilderness You will always satisfy There's honey in the rock Water in the stone Manna on the ground No matter where I go I don't need to worry now that I know Everything I 
bondage you've got this honey in the rock purpose in your plan power in the blood and healing in your hands started flowing when you said it is done everything you did's enough i keep looking i keep finding you keep giving keep providing i have all that i need you I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep looking, I keep finding. You keep giving, keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praying. You keep moving, I keep praising, you keep proving, I have all that I need, you are all that I need, yes I have all that I need, you are all that I need, yeah. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go, I don't Everything I need, you've got this honey in the rock, purpose in your plan, power in the blood, and healing in your hands. Started flowing when you said it is done. Jesus, who you are, is enough. This honey in the rock, this honey in the rock, this honey in the rock, this honey in the rock. And oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus.
seated and Jesus name is worthy and um, today call to worship is about giving thanks and according to the uh, book of Thessalonians he said we have to uh, give thanks to God in all circumstances I want to invite you in this time before I pray uh, you have something to talk to God to praise him to give thanks to God. No matter what, there's something that you can give thanks to God. So I will invite you to close your eyes and then to pray yourself a thanksgiving prayer to God. And then I will have a closing prayer. Father God, we come to you. We thank you for everything. You said we have to give thanks in all circumstances. It's all circumstances, no matter it's a good circumstances now or a bad situation in our life. No matter what, we give thanks to you because you're worthy and you're good all the time. And your grace is always sufficient to us, no matter what. God, you only you know the future. And our future is in your hands. We just want to commit our life to you once again. And we give thanks to you all the time. Because we know that our future will be great because of you. Because you are worthy. We just want to come to you, come closer today and continue to have that thankful heart to praise you today. Father, we thank you. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
I will linger and listen I can't miss a thing Lord, I know my heart wants more of you My heart wants something new So I surrender all All I want is to live within your love Be undone by who you are My desire is to know you deeper Lord, I will open up again Throw my fears into the wind I am desperate for a touch of heaven Whoa. Whoa. You're the fire in the morning You're the cool in the evening The breath in my soul Oh, the life in my bones There is no hesitation In your love and affection The sweetest of all Lord, I know my heart wants more of you my heart wants something new so i surrender all all i want is to live within your love be undone by who you are my desire is to know you deeper Lord I will open up again throw my fears into the wind I am desperate for a touch of heaven whoa whoa have your way in me now. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you can. Jesus has My desire is to know you deeper, Lord, I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind, I am desperate for a touch of heaven, na 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 Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Second Philippians chapter 
Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, by being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value yourselves above, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. Um, let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. And we're in all, and we stand in all of who you are. And as we give thought to your son this morning and what he has accomplished on the cross, may it just give us a sense of all and magnify our feel of who you are. So give us wisdom as we consider his humility and courage to apply into our lives. Um, yeah, may the words that come out of my mouth, oh God, be what you want to say to your people. And give thanks in your name. All right. Well, I'm glad to be back. And um, yes, I work with Urban Promise for some of those who Probably you know, I've shared many times before, and what's new is that I actually kind of resigned, um, and I'll be ending in May, and that's mostly, I still love the ministry, it's mostly just conflict with kids growing up, and um, just conflict with taking care of other people's kids, um, it's, and just balancing that with um, yeah, family life and ministry life. But I wanna share about just the as I'm ending my time with Urban Promise, just a little reflection on just the power of ministry and the power of being um, connected and pouring into the next generation. So that's um, some of the kids that I work with in the after school program. Uh, there's more during summer, but these are the consistent group um, that comes out during uh, after school program, like you see them Monday to Friday. And they're, they're pretty cute, they're super cute. Um, but they can be a lot. And, but I was thinking and talking about camp and this thought came up when I was having a discussion with, um, with somebody recently. And they said, oh, you know, uh, Urban Promise, you guys run camps, how much do you charge? You guys like charge pretty much nothing for camp and it's practically free. And um, it's not like the camps we run. Like we have a big budget, we have structure, we have all these things in place. Like your, your, your job is more like taking care of kids and making sure they don't go missing. And it's like more like a daycare service. And as, as I heard that, I was pretty offended. I'm like, really? I mean, like we're both believers and I'm pretty sure when God called us that we have something, um, we were faithful, God does amazing things. And I was challenged by that thought, and I brought that to my high school team um, this past summer, and I asked them, hey, guys, how much do we charge for camp? And they all answered, well, you know, 10 bucks a week, which is practically nothing. Like, sometimes when cameras can't play, we're like, eh, don't worry about it. It's just, it's nothing at all. And I asked them, like, so what's the difference then between our camp and I don't know, like a camp in, if you go up to Muskoka, which costs a thousand, thousands of dollars. I'm like, oh, uh, we can't compete with them if in terms of lodging, oh, we can't offer the latest equipment, we can't offer like 
really good meals for, for camp. Um, our trips are usually to the local water park. Uh, we take the bus, we take the TDC, not, we don't have like a bus that drives us everywhere. And that's also, that's also because of constraint of budget. $10 can't really do much with a small budget. But, and I challenge them, but what about if it's cost independent? I mean, we can show love to the kids, we can care about them, independent of how much we charge. We can care about deeply, we can um, be involved in their lives, independent of how much money they give. And so I challenge them, think about that as we run camp um, moving forward this summer, this past summer, and think of how we can impact our community just by being intentional and being purposeful with our time with the kids. And so that was um, summer. We had a great turnout. We don't, you guys play softball? We just taught kids how to play t-ball. But then they all had a great time um, learning, and we, it was a great six weeks of summer camp. Um, and I challenged them like, how impactful um, it would be if all our leaders, if all our staff were so intentional, they just have this sense of humility in being intentional in the, with the kids of the time we spend with them. And so we, last week, we had this RISE event, which we celebrated 25 years with, um, oh, yeah, that's our after school, with being intentional with helping them with their studies, teaching them God's truth, and just having fun with them, living life with them. And that is powerful, more than what money can buy. And so this past uh, Saturday, last Saturday on 20th, we had our 25th anniversary, and it was celebrating um, just the impact of Urban Promise in Toronto. And we highlighted this one child who kind of went through program, her name is Sarah, and she started program when she was four, and now she's 24. Um, she journeyed with us, and um, and this past week, she actually, she's, as, she's an intern now with, at Urban Promise. And what's amazing is that this past week, they, all the interns went down to the States to do a mission trip. And so it's really awesome to see the impact of that, of a kid that was, went through program, was a leader, and now after university comes back and serves and pours back into their community. Um, and it's a testament of how being humble and being faithful in ministry can have great impact, that God is doing great work in and through you if you're willing. And I want to talk about humility because it's so fundamental um, to the Christian value. It's the core of what all the Christian values are built upon. And it's tricky. Tim Keller says that humility is so shy, if you start talking about it, it leaves. But it's super foundational to just our Christian faith that everything else is built upon. If you get this part wrong, chances are it's hard to get anything else right if we don't have that right mindset. And for some of us, we grew up with this false sense of humility, it's especially in an Asian setting where I remember growing up, we go out for dim sum or going with meals with different families, and then, I don't know, parents like to show off by belittling their kids. They would talk about, oh man, like, oh look. And when I was growing up, I had this close family friend, his name's Kevin, he's a doctor, he's studying to be a doctor, and, and so, oh, look at your son, Kevin, he's studying to be a doctor, he's so hard working. And then look at our son, like, Jeff, you should like, all he does is just eat. And um, yeah, and, and, and it's this false sense of humility of, belittling and giving this platform for other parents to speak truth. But if there's really nothing to say, it becomes this like contest of like roast. Um, you just get roasted at a family dinner and it's just not that fun. And it's more, it's harmful and it's not life changing. And that's not what um, Paul is speaking of when he talks about humility. And it's not this false sense of humility, but it's humility that's rooted in Christ, that's life-changing, and it's transformative. And so what does he say that in verse one to four? And that it's have, having the mind of Christ that your humility is, means that you're doing nothing 
out of selfish ambition, that you value others above yourself, that you express concerns for others' interests. Humility isn't thinking of yourself less, not beating yourself down, but thinking, um, no, it's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking about yourself less, that you're considering others more. And that's what he was talking about in this letter to Philippi. And an intro to Philippians is that um, this is Paul's letter um, to the church in Philippi. And if you read in Acts 16, it was the first Jesus community that Paul started. And so now, a few years later, he's in jail, and he's writing back because he's encouraged by how this community is living out their faith, that there's genuine change, there's genuine um, life-giving community that's happening in, the ch in this community located in Philippi. And so uh, the book of Philippians, if you take chapter two, which we read, kind of anchors everything together. Um, it gives this idea of Christ's humility that we're um, learning from, we're imitating, and from there, all the rest um, of the different passage within all, all the different aspects of this letter kind of stems from this, um, this imagery of Christ being our source of humility. And so there's three aspects as we look at in this passage uh, of talking about what does that look like? What's the essence? What's the true essence of when we consider humility? First is sacrifice. Second is servanthood. And the third is obedience. And we're going to look at that starting in verse 6. And it says that, and it talks about Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In another um, version of the passage, it says that Jesus made himself nothing. He emptied himself. And it's very different from this imagery of um, when we consider what it was like as Jesus, as his last Adam from the first Adam, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they were in the presence of God, but what did they do? They tried to be God. They tried to, they considered themselves, man, if we eat this fruit, we can just be like God. But Jesus here does something completely different. He emptied himself, he, he surrendered, and it was this idea of surrender. And in and that was a mark of the Christian life, that we're surrendering. And it's in the beginning, we're surrendering our sins, we're surrendering our guilt, we're surrendering our shame. But as we progress, as we are being sanctified, what we surrender is our wants and desires, our success, because we know that God has something better for us on the other side of the surrender. One passage that comes to mind is Matthew chapter 8. Uh, with the parable of the hidden treasure in the field. And this whole passage talks about how this one man, he was walking and he finds this treasure in the field and he decides that, man, what I found here is worth way more than what I own. And so in, in his excitement, he goes back, he buries the treasure, he goes back, sells off everything to purchase this piece of land with the treasure in it. And it's this idea that when we sacrifice, when we give up, it's not a loss. That what we're getting in return is so much more. And so Paul echoes this in chapter 3, is that furthermore, I count all things to be but loss for the excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as dung, as poo, that I may gain Christ. And here Paul is talking about, you know what, if there's any credentials, if anybody can be proud of their religiosity, it's me. I was circumcised, I was a teacher of the law, I upheld the law, I even persecuted Christians. But all this, I, I give up, I consider loss in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. And that was, and that was a um, mark of humility. 
And so as we are going through these three, I also have three re reflective questions that goes along to get us to think about how does that apply to us? And the first question I want to ask you is, what am I willing or called to sacrifice? Is there anything that you're being called to, to let go of? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that if you, the cost of discipleship is that if you don't give up everything, you can't follow me. Is there anything you're holding back? Is there anything that you are unwilling to give up? And one thing I think about often, is, and it's never easy, and, and as we live in this society, we often thought of return on investment. Oh man, if I, is what I'm giving up worth it? And the part of this whole idea of faith is that what we're giving up um, is nothing in comparison to what we gain. And what we gain is Jesus Christ himself. And what he, and what he offers um, is so much more than what we can ever give up. And so that's sacrifice. The next is servanthood. And he continues talking about this, that rather he made himself, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. That this idea that Jesus became a servant to serve, that he didn't come to, serve, to be served, but he came to serve. And so one, uh, when I was reading this, I, it drew back my memory of this like, one famous movie I watched growing up as a kid. And it was this movie called Gladiator. It's this awesome, epic movie of um, redemption, of this Roman uh, gladiator, there's gore, there's everything awesome about it growing up as a kid. And what really struck out to me was when I bought the DVD at the back, there was this tagline that kind of sums up what this movie is about, and it says this. It's the general who became a slave, the slave who became a gladiator, and the gladiator who defied an emperor. And I thought, wow, that's such an amazing movie and such an amazing tagline. And I was, as I was reading this passage, I'm like, whoa. Um, what Jesus offers is something similar, but even much more amazing. If we consider similar parallels, Jesus, he was, in this passage, basically says that Jesus, the son of God who became a man, and the son of man who became a servant, and the suffering servant who rescued and redeemed the world. And that, and it's an amazing story because it's not only because it's true, but because we're also part of this story. That as we're being transformed, uh, we're being used by God to be part of this story to rescue and redeem those that we have a relationship with. And so the question I ask you then, as we think about servanthood, is how much am I willing to serve? What does that look like? What am I not willing to do? Or how far am I willing to serve others um, for the sake of the gospel? In just a subsequent passage to this, latter part of chapter two, we see two examples. Uh, Paul highlights Timothy, who shows genuine care and interest for those who he serves, that he was with Paul in this mission trip and building people up, and his faith was genuine because he genuinely cared. He didn't back away when things got hard, but he stuck out with Paul, caring for those um, and serving those, not because it benefited Timothy anyway. And he also highlighted um, Epaphrodite, Epaphroditus, where he was originally from Philippi, and, and the church in um, Philippi sent Epaphroditus to Paul while he was in jail with gifts. And Paul is praising him for he was serving, he was willing to serve, he was willing to serve Paul in jail to the point that he almost died. And it begs us to question, when we serve, how much am I willing to serve? And the last part of humility says in um, verse 8, and being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even death on a cross. 
that Jesus being come a man, he was obedient to God even to death. And as you remember what happened in Gethsemane, Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out that, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. That in his anguish, just before the cross, he was sweating blood, deep anguish, knowing what's ahead, what it means to be separated from God. In the midst of that, knowing pain, knowing suffering will come. He says, yet not my will, but yours be done. And we're often, and we're called to imitate um, Jesus' submissiveness to his Father. And I ask, how much am I willing to submit? How much am I willing to obey despite how things look, how things will turn out? And it's hard. Um, it's not in our nature to do so. I know, I know that as going, working with kids, kids get crazy. Uh, it's hard to get them in control. And even just asking them to take a picture. Let's just, just like take a group shot together and they can't help but scream. And so one really funny thing I found recently is that I updated my watch and had this function to test the noise level. I came home one day and I found this um, while I was at camp. And it says that, oh, sound levels hit 95 decibels. Just 10 minutes at this level, you'll probably have hearing damage. I mean, I'm like, that's, if you want a day in life of what it looks like running camp in the community of like Toronto community housing, just prepare for loud noises. And that's why. Um, and it's not just a problem issue with kids that they have trouble listening because they think what they do is right. It also happens in adults. My wife is a flight attendant, and every time she comes home um, from a long flight, she shares stories with me of just of um, passengers just refusing to listen. Even um, and it's and it's this whole idea that it's not just kids. Um, adults have trouble listening. Adults have trouble um, abiding by rules, being courteous, and such. Putting your legs from the aisle putting your seat up, yeah, it's not just kids. And I thought of this verse that it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it's trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, obey him, and he will make your path straight. Why is it so hard? And well, the truth of why it's so hard comes in the next verse. It says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Why is it so hard? Because often we think what we know is best. And because what we think what we know is best, we elevate ourselves, and that is the opposite of humility. That's pride. And Proverbs warns us against that, um, that to not be wise in our own eyes, for we know so little. And this, this obedience isn't just simply obeying. Often when we read um, narratives in the Bible, stories in the Bible, in Hebrews, it highlights different people of uh, heroes of faith. It takes a radical obedience. We have the story of Noah, when are we willing to obey when everybody else in our community is ridiculing us, shaming us for doing something as ridiculous as building an ark in the middle of dry land? Are we willing to obey when what God has, when the path ahead seemingly be impossible of Abraham and Isaac, that God gifted I, Abraham a son and right away asked him to sacrifice him. Can we still obey God when it hurts? Can we obey God? Can we submit to him into the fire, into the lion's den, as in Daniel and his friends? And as we think about these three questions that challenge us to think about, are we actually living out Christ's humility? What am I willing to sacrifice? How much am I willing to serve? And how much am I willing to submit? If the answer isn't to the utmost, if the answer isn't everything at all, everything, um, then there is an issue of pride. But we thank God for his grace that 
he is not telling us to invent something new. God is not sitting up in his throne telling us that, oh man, let's see if you can come up with a creative way to demonstrate humility, a new way that I've never seen before. But what he's asking us to do is to imitate his son, that Jesus came and he lived out what we, um, how we ought to live. He lived the perfect life. He demonstrated what humility actually looks like. And all we have to do is imitate him. And so because of that, uh, Paul, oh, sorry. Um, that's wrong verse up there, but Philippians 4.13, Paul says that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That this whole idea that it's radical obedience, it's that radical sacrifice, it's radical servanthood, but we can do it because the same spirit that overcame the grave, Jesus lives in us, and that we have the power to do it. We can do it because it's him living through us, in and through us. And so it's not impossible. And just like how at Urban Promise, I challenged our leaders to think of humility as the most important aspect of what they can offer to their community for, for change. I ask you, as you think about these questions of sacrifice to serve and to submit, that at TCMC, um, what if the church is not known just for its building or its facilities or the programs it runs, but the people of how the church itself, the congregants, is demonstrating humility and servanthood to the community around you. What if you guys are running VBS camp this summer? And what if VBS isn't known for the crafts that you do, the trips that you guys go on, um, but it's about how the leaders are intentionally caring for the kids, how they put aside their own interests and caring deeply for the kids' interests and watching them grow. What if in your own personal life that it's not demonstrated, not noted by the amount of success you have, the amount of money in your bank account, the, the type of house or the type of car you drive, but the radical um, attitude of how you fear God. How much of an impact would that be? How much of an impact can God use you um, to change those around you? Let us pray. And um, to thank God that in all of this, as we think about servanthood, that it's not us doing it on our own. It's not about us trying harder. It's not about us being a better version of ourselves, but allowing Jesus Christ to change us deeply that we get to live out for his glory. Just like what we sang earlier, um, that all praise and glory is unto him, that he alone is worthy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of grace that while we were still stuck in our sins, that we are, we are still in darkness, you came and you rescued us. And you gave us a glimpse of what life can be. Um, and you offered us new life through your son, Jesus Christ. And as we think about humility, of what it means to humble ourselves, um, I pray that you will challenge us in areas where we're prideful, that you will challenge us to consider how we have put ourselves before others. Um, but in challenging us and convicting us, I pray also, Father, for the power of your spirit to give us courage to move ahead and step forward and to be more and more like your son, to think about how your son would serve, how your son would sacrifice, and how your son would submit to you and allow us to do the same. And may all, may all glory be to you. Thank you and pray this in your name. Uh, thank you so much for that message. Um, as we respond, um, yeah, we, we picked this song because it's just a, such a great reminder of um, who Jesus is. You know, he, 
he sacrificed himself, um, and it's a great reminder of why we should sacrifice and um, submit. So yeah, let's all rise and praise and respond together. There's a time for communion, so let's um, 
pray the confession and pardon together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our labors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy are you, and blessed is your name, uh, blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you send in the fullness of time, redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for our sin, for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of the, his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to a church, deliver us from slavery to sin and death, and make with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. Gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciple, and said, Take it, this is my blood, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciple, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, pour out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Let's proclaim the mystery of faith together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We ask uh, the server and musician to come. As communion is like, is for, for those who is baptized or confirmed. If you are ready, you can, uh, after we partake, we will ask you to come forward as well. You can take the communion to to sacrament to to go home to partake yourself in your own time, or you can uh, partake the sacrament in here. If you're ready, you can come from this side of the aisle and then go back from this side of the aisle.
Please all rise for the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let's receive the benediction by faith. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
Now is the time for offering. You may drop your offering in the uh, offering box located at the entrance of the sanctuary or e-transfer to inquiry at tcmc.ca or send a check to the church office during office hour just to make sure that you call prior to your delivery. We have two announcements today. The first one, AGM important dates. Uh, April 28, which is today, there will be a posting of a list of council election candidates and active members at the church and also on the website. May 8 to 26 will be the council election. June 2nd, there will be a posting of elected council members, AGM and agenda announcement, uh, again at the church and on the website. June 15, uh, sorry, June 5th is the important one. There will be online registration for all AGM will begin. June 16, the posting of uh, board election candidates uh, at church and on the website as well. And June 23rd is also the important one, uh, AGM, election of board members and the president. So please remember those dates. And second announcement, first aid. Church acquire an automated external defibrillator, yes, AED, which can deliver a shock to patient whose pulse has stopped during emergencies to return to the heart to its normal rhythm. And our church wish to compile a list of individuals who have received training in AED and also CPR. So if you are trained in AED and CPR, or if you are interested in receiving training, please email Brother Stone Ng, our church secretary at stone.ng at tcmc.ca. And uh, please refer to the next slide for next week's responsibilities. After a moment of silent prayer, our service will be concluded. God bless and see you all next Sunday.